Our scripture this morning comes from the book of James, and in keeping with our latest uh, scriptures, it's a short one. One verse, James 5, verse 16. James says this, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you in all ways, for you are our rock and our ever-present Redeemer. Amen. So we are at week number five of our seven-week series on John Wesley's 22 questions. And if you haven't been here previously, those 22 questions were from John Wesley. And, and let me just pause. I, at some point this week, I was bringing up the topic of our sermon series to someone. They said, who's John Wesley? And I realized that not everybody knows who John Wesley is. So John Wesley is the, he was an Episcopal priest in England who came to the United States a couple of times at least and was the founder of Methodism. And when Methodism got to the United States, eventually it broke off from the Church of England and became the United Methodist Church here in the United States, or, or the Methodist Church and later the United Methodist Church. Anyway, so that's who John Wesley is. And these 22 questions for which we have copies of them on your pews. If you need a copy, you don't need it for the sermon, but if you wanted it for reference or to take with you, just grab one of those. You can have that. These 22 questions were things that John Wesley and his brothers and sisters in the faith would ask themselves and ask each other in order to be fully accountable, not just to themselves, but to each other. So today's three questions, which are 15, 16, and 17 on the list, are kind of hard-hitting in at least a couple of areas. The three questions are this. Number 15 is, am I defeated at any point part of my life? Number 16, am I jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, or distrustful? Yes. How do I spend my spare time is the last question, number 17. So the first two of these questions, questions hit kind of hard because they uh, make us sort of dig into the parts of our lives that are painful when they talk about being defeated or am I jealous or impure. And the last question about spare time seems a little less touchy. But when you think about it, many of us are very territorial about this issue of what we do with our spare time. It's a legitimate question to ask, though. And I'll contend that the scripture we just read from James, that short scripture, touches on all three of these questions. So let's first say what that scripture is not about. So the scripture says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Now this scripture is not about us confessing to each other because we have some sort of power to forgive sins. None of us are mediators for other people with God. We never see any place in the New Testament where we confess our sins to each other as the means of finding forgiveness. So then you'll ask, well, then why would I want to confess my sins to someone else? And it's amazing to me how we can sometimes take a short statement and focus on only one part of the statement and not the other. We see it constantly in the media where like somebody who's being interviewed will say 10 things, but the media will hone in on one item, which instantaneously becomes juicy gossip out of context with the other items. And here in the scripture, there are two commands, right? There's one to confess and one to pray. And we have to keep those two commandments together and not treat them as separate or standalone commands. We are to confess our sins to each other for the purpose of praying for each other. We confess our sins and ask others to pray for us, and they do the same with us, and we pray for them. Which brings up a really important point about Christianity and the church, and it's this. Our walk with God is supposed to be a community effort. We're not just a bunch of individuals who happen to show up in New Orleans on this corner who are worshiping Jesus. We come together as a community and we're supposed to act and function as a community. When we have communion after this sermon, we do that as a measure of 
community and unity and not one of individuality. So our walk with God is not intended to be something that we try to do alone. And the corollary to that is this, is that we are to work very hard to reject the idea that we are entitled to privacy when it comes to our faith. Now this goes along with my frequent instruction to people who tell me, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I don't need to. You know, if you even just slightly scratch below the surface of that statement, you realize first that Jesus Christ started the church. And there's nowhere in the gospel or in the New Testament where Jesus or the disciples or leaders in the church say this, well, you know that church thing? Well, it's for some Christians and not others. The point is, as a Christian, you really don't have any choice about church, except picking the church that you want to fully participate in. I kind of like that the Catholics have made not attending church a sin, although I think it's appropriate that you know why not attending church is an affront to God. So in this church community, the worst thing we could do is to allow our sins to remain private and secret and fester. How many people do you know have, who have fallen completely away from the faith or taken to its worst extreme are dead because they wouldn't let people in to help them with their sins and their issues, wouldn't let people help them with their walk with God? We're supposed to be involved in each other's walk of faith. Paul tells the Galatians in Galatians 6, he says this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgressions, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Not rebuke, gentleness. And Paul continues, he says, Keep watching yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, that level of openness between people seems a little scary. It is. But I go back to one of our first weeks in this sermon series where we were taught that we are supposed to keep confidential competences that people ask us to. And the church then needs to be a place where all of us can seek the help we need. And each of us needs to be a resource for the other. That sort of opportunity may come across as new to you. What's it look like for you to open up that way? And look, it's, it's not like just coming forward after a sermon every week or so and asking for a prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. But what we're talking about to hear today is much more personal and much more regular. We're talking about a strong, ongoing relationship with other people in the church where we truly know what is going on with each other so we can help each other. So I want you to think about this question for a moment. Who in this church really knows you? The real you, not your public persona, but who you are deep down in your core. The scripture today is telling us we need relationships like that. For example, Sally Yule, she knows me like that. That's why she's in church every Sunday. She knows there's a lot of praying to do. There's no way, though, you're going to confide in someone in the way we're talking about if you do not have a bona fide, strong, trusting relationship with that person. So is this practice of confession we're talking about, is it just therapeutic? Because we know it's good. There's some benefit from getting things off our chest. And the scripture today, actually, in its second half, tells us, in fact, that there is more. James tells us in the second part of verse 16, he says, The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So here's a question. Why wouldn't you want people praying for you? Particularly about your sins, an area where you need spiritual strength. Well, the answer is because it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed about that stuff. I'm afraid to talk about that stuff. And this is where I love Paul's simple statement to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Hmm. 
And then Paul continued. He says, as God is faithful, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. When you are tempted, God will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So in other words, that first sentence was saying, there's no sin you have committed or which you will commit in the future that God and even humankind hasn't seen before. Of course, the last part about God providing you a way out of temptation, I'll humbly suggest to you that that way out works within this framework we're talking about today, being willing to open up to someone else, being willing to open up about your temptations or about the things that we listed in the first two questions today, opening up about our jealousies, our impurities, our improprieties, our criticisms of people that are undeserved, where we're defeated in our life, which means our sins, basically, our irritability, our tendency to be oversensitive, and our distrustfulness, being willing to open up to other people about that. Now, that's quite a list. That's a lot to cover, which I think gets us to our second or third question today is, what do you do with your spare time? Now, you've probably noticed that in all of these questions we've been through, we've now been through 17 of them, I really haven't offered any answers from John Wesley to any of the questions, because the questions are more probative than they are suggesting a, a yes or no answer, but there are, for every one of the questions, inferences to be drawn. And for this last question about spare time, the obvious inference is this, I'd better be doing something valuable and good with my spare time. Remember last week we learned that the scripture says that we need to be making the most of every opportunity. We all need rest. We all need recreation. But may I suggest to you that we need to consider that our spare time is probably the best time and the most obvious opportunity when we can make ourselves available to be fully present for someone who needs to confess to us. So they can confess to us and we can pray for them. Today's scripture from James is telling us that we need to be genuine and authentic to other people. Now we usually think of that as being something that is a benefit for the recipient, but today we've seen that the benefit of being genuine and authentic is principally to the person who opens up. Not only to get their burdens off their chest, but when they do that, when they open up, they have a greater chance of beating his or her demons by the power of prayer of the other persons or persons to who the information is revealed. So folks, Let's get real, both in making confessions and in receiving them. As it turns out, contrary to what Jack Nicholson said in A Few Good Men, you can handle the truth. Let us pray. God, open us up as a church community. Make us whole, Lord by allowing us to be courageous, to be understanding, to be sympathetic, to be prudent, wise. Lord, all those things that we tamp down when we hold in the things that are bothering us, Lord. Lord, we know when we are that community and are open with each other and are working through our problems, Lord, that we can be the church that you want us to be and we be prepared to go out and help other people, Lord, because we have been helped. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, and our Savior. Amen.